Love and Light. This is Healthy Talk Show, recording live on Monday, November 25th, 2019. I'm Robert. And I'm Marissa. Show notes will be over at healthytalkshow.com forward slash 36. On this episode of Healthy Talk Show, we have racial, racial bias and algorithms and are women destroying academia? But first... Pope Francis arrived in Nagasaki, bringing a message of peace and demanding world leaders end the use of nuclear weapons. 27,000 people were instantly killed when the city was devastated by a nuclear bomb at the end of the Second World War. The Pope laid a wreath at a ground zero memorial to victims of the bombing. It's the first papal visit to Japan in nearly four decades, with many Catholics waiting in the rain to hear his message. Convinced as I am that a world without nuclear weapons is possible and necessary, I ask political leaders not to forget that these weapons cannot protect us from current threats to national and international security. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck. Give up your nuclear weapons. That'd be nice. Yeah. Definitely. But we saw how that played out in the Cold War. Yeah. Not so well. NBC Nightly News. Military families sue private housing developers over health hazards on base. You can smell that immediately. The home exactly as the family left it a month ago after a test came back showing the home had become a petri dish for mold and forced the family to flee to temporary housing. Is it everywhere? Every room. Mm. Every room. Your eyes will feel it the back of your throat. The m- Why is he wearing... She's wearing oh, a, yeah. That. He's wearing a, not very, he's wearing a particle, particle mask and she's wearing a respirator. Yeah. One of those is uh, way yeah. more effective. One of those is not effective. And the other <laughs> one. <laughs> so he might be breathing in some stuff he doesn't want to breathe in. Just <laughs> FYI. Those are only good for particles. The back of your throat. The microscopic mold spores hidden in the air, the walls and their furniture. A clean home score, 2000 mold spores or less. The sample gathered at the Pisano's. More than 63,000. Oh. They say the cause... A lot of spores. Raw sewage. It was all flooding under this house for months. You had sewage raw, under your home. Raw sewage, eight inches of raw sewage under our home. And that's when we had to pack a suitcase and leave. The Pisano home, one of more than 32,000 managed by Hunt, the largest private military housing developer in the nation. Now the Pisanos are suing, joining other military families in a group lawsuit against Hunt. Some, like the Hyatts, unable to afford leaving the very homes they call health hazards. We're going to lose our mattresses, we're going to lose our furniture. Do you feel trapped? Yes. Nationwide, nearly two dozen families have filed lawsuits against private military housing companies, accused of mismanaging homes for countless military families. Yeah, it's it's frustrating. Air Force Chief Christopher Lantane calls the problem systemic. Systemic and frustrating, apparently. Dang. Yikes. Not good. Yeah, and it's sad because we spend so much money on war. Yeah, and then they this is the what they're living in. Yeah, this maybe their families we need in. to build these military houses. So. Maybe. KGET News, California puts brakes on fracking permits in oil crackdown. Uh, In essence, the governor's major announcement calls for a crackdown on what's called enhanced oil recovery. That's a process that has been widely used for decades in Kern County to bring up heavy crude oil trapped beneath the surface. It's the same process linked to those long-running oil seeps in the McKittrick area, which have drawn the attention of Governor Newsom and state regulators. So here is what the governor announced today. First, Newsom is establishing a moratorium, or HALT, on new wells that use high-pressure steam injection at pressures high enough to crack the underground rock formation. The moratorium extends to hydraulic fracturing, also known as fracking. You see a simulator of that process here. Second, the state will update and implement rules and regulations for public health and safety protections in communities near oil and gas extraction facilities. And third, California will independently review pending applications to conduct hydraulic fracturing and other well stimulation practices. Now, in a statement, the governor said, quote, these are necessary steps to strengthen oversight of oil and gas extraction as we phase out our dependence on fossil fuels and focus on clean energy sources. This transition cannot happen overnight. It must advance in a deliberate way to protect people, our environment, and our economy. Hmm. Obviously, some people are happy about this. Some people are not. Yeah. Fracking is... 
very controversial. There's there's a lot of crazy reports about fracking, about people getting weird stuff in their water and stuff blowing up. Yeah, plus increase in earthquakes. In California, where they don't have many earthquakes, you know, but, you know. Yeah, but (laughs) then, can you show just that last screen right there, Mm -hmm. the oil? Uh, I'm just, I... I can't like it, though, because he's talking about phasing out our dependence on fossil fuels. And I mean, yes, but are we focusing on the right solutions? It sounds like a lot of taxes on oil. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. In California, we've already discussed how they have some of the highest oil prices in the nation. Yeah. Or, or they, they do have, they do. excuse me. Absolutely. So, uh... <laughs> And they have oil. <laughs> it's which is a, just strange. a lot of a lot of people in California are very unhappy about that. They say yeah. if we have oil underneath us, we should not be paying more for it. <laughs> you know, I'm just saying there are riots going on in France. <laughs> <laughs> California already has a lot of homeless. <laughs> I I don't know. <laughs> I I'm just saying if you want to get away from fossil fuels, let's look at other actual clean energy and diversifying nuclear. Yeah. Well, you know, G- Gavin Newsom's yeah. not. He's not talking about nuclear right now. Oh, okay. Too busy. (laughs) Heart of Illinois, ABC, re-isolation rooms in central Illinois schools. On Tuesday, the Chicago Tribune and ProPublica published a scathing report that accused schools statewide for misusing isolation rooms. The rooms are designed for students who can harm themselves or others. But the Tribune found that they were also used for things as small as talking out of turn or not doing class work, which is illegal. Thankfully. The report mentions three local districts which have documented use of seclusion rooms. Illinois Valley Central District 321, Woodford County Special Education Association, and McLean County's Unit 5. Using district data, the Tribune founded IVC, 70% of isolated timeouts were not triggered by a safety concern. The same is true for 58% of isolated timeouts in Woodford. Like that they left out the Allen School. <laughs> Woodford County. The Tribune's data also shows 3% of isolation use did not follow a safety concern at Unit 5. Unit 5 issued a statement addressing the report, saying, quote, We are confident that the use of our time away rooms fell within the scope of the law. Our students are not placed in these rooms for punishment. This is a calm, safe space to de-escalate risky behavior for that student. This is a last resort when all other interventions have been tried and failed. Hmm. Unit 5 also Mm -hmm. claims assumptions were made in the article saying they believe 100% of their use of isolation fell within state guidelines. What do you think? Some of those stories are pretty horrific. Yeah, in the Tribune. Yeah, and they were talking about students being locked in just immediately upon arrival Mm. or... And then they're left alone, unattended, as somebody just watches while they kind of record, so... That's dangerous. Yeah. It didn't... Yeah. Didn't seem like a safe space. Yeah, it's definitely... (laughs) Yeah, not a supervised space. And it mentioned, like, the rooms weren't even well padded. They were made of cinder blocks or plywood, and they're supposed to be... Yeah. Bad stuff. Well, just... Re, it emphasizes what we've been talking about, that teachers are underpaid, their classrooms are getting Expected too large. Expected to be the mental health experts, the doctors, yeah. everything, everything for the students, everything. Yeah. And it goes back to what are parents supposed to do? Yeah. And then what are teachers supposed to do with less salary, less... Yeah. Parents got to pay the teachers. If you want the teachers yeah. to take care of the kids, someone's got to fund that. Yeah. Democracy Now! Julian Assange update. Dozens of doctors have written an open letter to the British Home Secretary warning WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange's health is so bad he could die inside London's high-security Belmarsh prison. The more than 60 doctors are calling on the British government to move Assange to a hospital. Assange is currently jailed on charges related to his decision to skip bail and take refuge inside the Ecuadorian embassy to avoid extradition to Sweden on sexual assault assault charges. The investigation has been dropped for the third time. Third time. Man, he's How many times do you have to so drop much? it? <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> How many times do you have to drop the investigation? That just is so weird. For the third time? Yeah. 
Oh. Assange now faces possible extradition to the United States, where he faces up to 175 years in prison for his role in publishing U.S. classified documents exposing U.S. war crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan. The fact that they got him out of that Ecuadorian embassy in the first place is bullshit. Yeah. The U.S. wants him bad. Don't give him up. Free I, Assange. I still understand why people hate him, too. At least the media Exposing likes information him. that's <laughs> accurate. He didn't fabricate or lie. He didn't generate the information. He provided the information. Go after the people who generated it. If you don't like yeah. it, if you don't like what he published, go after yeah. them. And they're always talking about, oh, the press, we got to protect the press. And then, no, press freedom, press freedom. Yeah. But they, oh, oh. WikiLeaks? No, 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 no. Yeah. Okay. We got to regulate the press now. Yeah. What? what? Wait, explain to mm-hmm. me how that works. USA Today, Uber reportedly wants to listen in on your rides by piloting an audio recording feature. Allegations that numerous Uber and Lyft drivers have sexually assaulted their passengers. Uber has been vocal about their push for added safety. And now the Washington Post reports part of their initiative will allow riders to record audio from their journeys. The feature will prompt riders to report any safety incidents during travel and then submit the audio if there was. But neither riders nor drivers will be able to go back and listen to it. Initially, they're piloting the program in Latin America because, quote, laws in the United States around consent to being recorded can vary from state to state. I like oh, that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Damn U.S. laws make it real hard. Yeah. But they hope to test the feature in the U.S. soon as well. It's worth noting the writers may also opt out of the recording service if they prefer. This is just the latest in Uber's push for increased safety during rides with its app, previously introducing an in-app 911 dialer, as well as automated safety check-ins if a ride changes its predetermined course. In 2018, a report by CNN found that 120 people, including 103 Uber and 18 Lyft passengers, had accused drivers of sexual assault. Of sexual assault. I'm going to say that like a good, it's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> this guy's doing an ad read. Really good. I like it. That's yeah. Why. <clears throat> really good. Really good. <clears throat> what do you think? Yeah. The math is bad here. 103 plus 18 does not equal 120. Yeah. Well, bad. Bad math. Bad math. It's a big cover your <laughs> butt move, it seems. To record but, everything. Good yeah, luck. Yeah, but I just, I understand why they're doing it. Tired of being spied on, though, at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you get into these Uber vehicles now, though, just to protect themselves. The drivers all have dash cams. Some yeah. will point at you. They're pointing. There are dash cams everywhere. It's like you're walking. Yeah. I'm, it's very uncomfortable, but these people have to protect themselves. If they that, get hit with some kind of law, anything, that's they get true. with any kind of allegation, I'm sure yeah. Uber will, they're not going to protect them. Yeah. So it's rough. PBS NewsHour racial bias and widely used hospital algorithm study finds. There are two ways that um, we can identify how sick a person is. One is how many dollars are spent on that person. Oh, wait, my bad. Where exactly is the bias coming from was the question asked. My bad. Read the wrong thing. You know, the assumption being the more health care um, they come in for, the more treatment that they get, the more dollars they spend, and presumably the sicker they are if they're getting all that treatment. And the other way is that, you know, we can measure actual um, biophysical things, you know, from lab tests, what kind of um, uh, conditions or diseases they might have. So it seems like this algorithm was relying on the cost prediction definition. Um, in other words, the more dollars a patient was projected to spend um, on the part of an insurance company or a hospital, then that was a sign of how sick they were going to be. Um, And that seems to be where the bias um, emerged. Ooh. Jeez. (laughs) That's not good. Researchers use biometric data instead of just cost? Yeah, so instead of relying on just costs to um, predict which patients are going to need follow-up care, they actually used um, biometric data, physical, biophysical data, physiological data, um, and they saw a dramatic difference. Um, you know, in the previous model, the um, algorithm missed some 48,000 extra chronic conditions that African-American patients had. Um, but when they rejiggered the algorithm... Rejiggered, rejiggered. the algorithm. Mm. What does that mean? Rejiggered the algorithm. <laughs> mm. Yeah, rejiggered the algorithm. 
rejiggered the algorithm to look more at actual biological data, they brought that down to about 7,700. Um, so it was about an 84% reduction. Whoa, in that bias. is crazy. Yeah. That is some rejiggering. <laughs> yeah. They really rejiggered that handle. <laughs> Consequence, consequences for the algorithm company. Optum. Yeah, so the day after the study came out, actually, um, New York regulators, the Department of um, Financial Services and the Department of Health sent a letter to the company saying they were investigating this algorithm and that the company had to um, show that uh, the way the algorithm worked wasn't in violation of anti-discrimination laws in New York. How do so you show that? Or it sounds. It sounds like you showed that it's not. <laughs> it sounds that like it's very biased. Yeah, it sounds like it is. Right, it is biased. So yeah. how do you prove that it's not? <laughs> so that investigation is pending. One encouraging thing is that when the researchers did the study, they actually reached back to Optum and let them know about the discrepancy in the data, and um, the company was um, glad to be told about it. And um, I'm told that they're working on a fix. Um, yeah. And uh, the other uh, the other encouraging thing is that the researchers have actually now launched an initiative to help um, other companies who may be um, behind similar algorithms oh to mm. help them fix any um, biases Wait. in their mm, program. Fun. But fix or rejigger? Rejigger. Just maybe rejigger, maybe rejigger. charge them too. Mm, don't know. Yeah. Optum. Don't know who they are, but I have a video from them. Predicting better outcomes. Here they are. For many people, getting the right care and medications they need to stay healthy can be frustrating and confusing. What if there was a better way? Really frustrating. Yeah, confusing. why is it frustrating and confusing? I don't know, because they say it is. I thought, you, I thought you went to your doctor and, you know, hopefully... Listened. I'm already confused. Yeah, I'm already confused why this is so confusing. Where am I supposed to go? <laughs> Provide accurate information with clear choices. And what if we could also determine the best health and savings Wait. opportunity? And mm -hmm. how best to screw you over. Probably. <laughs> at the best time for each member. At the best time to Guess screw you what? over. We can. Just imagine two patients with similar conditions. Through intelligence and analytics, we can now... Pre intelligence and analytics. Yeah, what does that mean? With racial bias. We're spying on you. Predict which collecting all your is data. More likely to join a care management program changing the course of their health or switch to a lower cost medication to increase savings. Also, that was their their own commercial was kind of racially biased <laughs> that they have the African American guy going to a low cost guy, low cost plan. Yeah, well, what are you saying? Well, what do you oh. Come on, this is the same company that the researchers yeah, found. They were I have so many issues well, with this company. Hello, they're look, so biased hello, and they're pretending like they're not biased. Proof is in the pudding there. You <laughs> this is frustrating. How do we do it? When we engage with a member, we integrate all available data points, giving but us like, a holistic view so you we mean, can focus on... You we're never going to get through this if you keep cutting I, it off. It's 50, we're 51 seconds in. You keep going. We got, I, I'm we just keep saying going. They, they label everybody. Yeah, that's what yeah, they do. It's frustrating with these algos. I know. Sorry, I know. Going. I know you're not going to let me get through this. All right, I, just let I go. know. When we're editing it, you were, oh, this video is the worst. <laughs> yeah. That's why I put it. I'm waiting. Okay. I'm just warning everybody. It's going to take a very long time to get through this because... Marissa is very triggered by this. Individual needs. Then, using leading edge predictive modeling and machine learning. Predictive modeling, machine learning. Yeah. Again, bull. <laughs> made possible through OptumIQ, we're able to predict the best health and savings options for each individual. Regardless of how and when the member is engaged, they're presented with the best opportunities, ranked by the probability they will accept the option. What? By personalizing. <laughs> that is so screwing with. <laughs> that is messed up. Yeah. Using the choices, we're increasing engagement and acceptance. In fact, acceptance of what? Accept health and savings offers more than 60% of the time, which is far higher than traditional outreach methods. Because of Optum IQ and machine learning, recommendations have increased member acceptance rates acceptance by three rates times. I don't really know. Not quite sure. Yeah. More than average. Predictive modeling and machine learning is a win for plan sponsors too, because providing better choices can drive down the total cost of care. To nothing. Yeah. The more complex healthcare becomes, 
the more we are simplifying the experience with easy-to-use tools and personalized health and savings opportunities uh, when yeah. and See, where needed. I, I hate to that. To learn more about how we're improving care and lowering mm -hmm. costs, visit optum.com slash optumrx. So Got it. They always do the, oh, you're so stupid. You can't understand healthcare costs. No, healthcare costs are outrageous. And yeah, they, keep, it's, <laughs> they bill you after. Yeah. They, they I can you, understand an invoice. If you send yeah. me an invoice, I'm not stupid. I can understand it. If, <laughs> if you make it super complicated and you bill me 30 times. That's the problem. <laughs> Wait, except, uh, yeah. I thought I already paid for this. It's. Yeah. I. Why, why can't we just actually treat people equally and offer the same plan to everyone? Why, no. why do we have to categorize You have to people? be in the algo. You have to be sorted. You have to be yeah. in your little compartment. That's the way I, it is. I have so many issues with this using data, too. And this. So where are they getting this uh, this data oh, about you? Oh, from your you employers. Go? When I was in the private sector, we had to do what was called wellness testing to receive lower cost health insurance. That so, is disturbing. Or do you smoke? If you say yes, oof, you better sign up for a non... For, uh, Tobacco, whatever, to quit smoking, whatever that program's called. The program yeah. is quit smoking. You better sign up within Smoking certain cessation number. Yeah, things. programs. I don't know what it's called, though. It's similar to AA, mm. whatever it is for smoking. You got to sign up for something like that. Oh, geez, really? Got to get your, got to get your blood test done every year. Horrible, yeah. horrible stuff. Plus, really I can't bad. help. And if you're really medicated, if you have, if you're unhealthy, you live, live an unhealthy life, you have high blood pressure or something, but you're just medicated for it. You're fine. They'll pass you in the wellness test. They'll say you're fine, which is the craziest thing to me. Yeah. It's instead of trying to get you off of the medication you're on, they just, oh, good to go. Yeah, you're they, well. They you're got, well. They you're got in the system. Algo, Robert. You're in the system. They'll organize. <sighs> Here, we'll, we'll charge you more. We'll confuse you. Uh, no, it's so frustrating. All right. Ready to move on. Well, I just wanted off. to add, yes. you know, like you have the 23 and me mm -hmm. and all these DNA yeah, things. What, what's they, stopping them from all working yeah, together? Yeah, precisely. What is stopping them? Oh, well, their terms of service says this, that, well, okay, they can change it. Yeah. Everything can be changed in time. Yeah. You give them this information now, five years down the road, their intentions can change. You don't know. A lot of companies start off with good intentions and they get gobbled up by big evil corporations. It happens all the time. Yeah. And then things start to change. We see it. Every or they just start seeing dollar signs. Yeah. Do they think they, you think they actually really want to save you money? They want to try to nickel yeah. and dime you with these little plans. Exactly. Or are they trying to make money? HealthyTalkShow.com slash support. We don't try to make money. We're just trying to make a podcast. NBC Nightly News. Warning over controversial stem cell clinics and unapproved treatments. They said that there was no chance of anything going wrong because uh, it was coming from my own body. 79-year-old Doris Tyler tried stem cells after reading a promotional book by the founders of Cell Surgical Network. They claimed stem cells could treat macular degeneration, an eye condition with no cure. The Cell Surgical Network referred Doris to an affiliate clinic in Georgia where doctors... Ay, yeah, yeah, that needle looks... That, oh. Yeah. Oh, that thing's huge. If you're not watching the video, you need to watch it. ...took stem cells from Ooh. fat in her stomach and injected them into her eyes. Three months later, she was blind. An ophthalmologist who examined Doris after the treatment says her vision loss is more likely than not the result of the stem cell procedures. I just slumped on the floor and knew that total darkness was all I was ever going to see again. Doris is now suing the Georgia Clinic and Cell Surgical Network. The Georgia Clinic declined to comment. And in a statement to NBC News, Cell Surgical Network says, Cell Surgical Network is a teaching research company and owns no clinics. We cannot discuss any details since it is being litigated. Our research group was involved in 12 macular degeneration cases over a four-year period, and 10 reported improvement in their vision. Damn. Interesting. I'm curious, these, was she little, just misled? Or? These little pop-up stem cell clinics, Yeah, apparently. And NBC visits one. You may feel a little needle. So this is the bone marrow you took from the patient? Yes. And then after processing, these are the stem cells you can put back into the patient in the area that they need treatment. Exactly. Dr. B now, I'm just going to say, I have no idea where they found this doctor. Why? You'll know what I see. <laughs> 
Benjamin Bieber charges between four and eight thousand dollars per treatment for rotator cuff tears, hair restoration, even erectile dysfunction. Hey, it does it all. Says, yeah. <laughs> that stem cell therapies are only approved for blood and immune disorders. But today you treated somebody for a hip condition. I'm not involved with the politics. I just want to make my patients better. And I know uh, over the last seven to eight years, using stem cell therapy has made a big difference in people's lives. But the FDA. That's what I mean. It's come back to that. Yeah. This is, I don't know about the politics, but I just want to make people feel better. <laughs> what about come the on. research? Yeah, what about the research, dude? You're a doctor. Let's start room, with that he's not, are you a politician or a doctor? Why'd you come that way? Yeah. <laughs> just so weird. Warns more research is needed. Dr. Peter Marks evaluates stem cell treatments for the FDA. Orthopedic conditions to kidney disorders to neurologic, you know, brain problems. There's not evidence that we have that they're safe and effective yet. Very interesting. Yeah. No evidence, according to the FDA, they're safe or effective. Yeah, I thought there had been some promising trials, but uh, of course. It takes the FDA a very long time yeah. to make anything, to say anything. So by the time they say it's safe and effective, it's probably no longer safe and effective. <laughs> That's yeah. the nature of the FDA. And in this case, well, who knows what exactly went wrong. And yeah. it, it is early stages of treatment and... Sometimes yeah. you just have bad luck, unfortunately. Yeah, that's really bad luck. Fox 59 News calls for Indiana University professor's resignation following controversial tweet. Ready for this? Let's do Eric it. Rasmussen at IU Bloomington shared an article titled, Are Women Destroying Academia? Probably. Okay. He pulled a line from it saying geniuses are overwhelmingly male because they combine outlier high IQ with moderately low agreeableness and moderately low conscientiousness. I think I should be able to quote from an article without saying I agree with everything in the article. The business economics professor says he uses Twitter to keep track of interesting articles. The publication he tweeted says it's a collection of controversial perspectives largely excluded from the American mainstream media. Did you agree with article i can't say that because i haven't actually looked back at it i've been so busy to see what was in it in a letter cop out yeah oh, that that a was, cop out answer that dude was a cop out you just say yes or no or just say no <laughs> yeah just say no <laughs> yeah why, <laughs> why why would you be expected to agree with everything yeah. an article says you can just but. say no about you can and, yeah and yes did you agree with the article no no not not no, not everything in, yeah not it's in no exactly to the Kelly School of Business community, IU Provost Lauren Robel did not mince words, noting other controversial social media posts from Rasmussen over the years. She calls his views racist, sexist, and homophobic. Academic freedom should protect me even if I believed all the things the provost attributed to me. This is not in keeping with anything of the values of Indiana University uh, and the vast majority of the people here at IU. Chuck Carney with the university says they cannot fire Rasmussen because of his First Amendment rights. And he has tenure. Yeah. Can't fire a tenured professor. That's true. Okay. But there are already messages on campus. Oh my gosh. Just oh yeah. That. Oh my. Are oh you serious? yes. This oh, this is, is, oh my. this is. Okay. This Whoa. is, this if, is good. So if you are watching or sorry, listening in the audio mm -hmm. podcast is all this graffiti all over the streets. The Eric, no. Eric Rasmussen, mm -hmm. don't stand for hatred. Like, whoa, that's... Now, it seems like that other professor, the provost, she's going after him because she's documenting other instances in the past. Now she's writing a statement saying, oh, I've been watching this guy for a while. Blah, blah. That's yeah. just so weird. <laughs> Why? I, this is very strange. It's It's definitely an overblown <laughs> reaction. But yeah, this is this is apparently across the street yeah, from the school. Or crazy. <laughs> Campus calling for just that. I, I would transfer out of the class personally. Um, there's no way I would stay in that class. I'd expect better. But you know, they're entitled to their own opinions, but I'd expect better. IU says... And that's the problem with the modern college system. These students think they're entitled to whatever. Oh, someone says something different? I'm going to drop the class. I'm out of here. He offended me. What? Do, do you read... Read, read the tweet. Ah. Yeah. It is making changes in Rasmussen's classroom to create a double blind system on assignments that would hopefully prevent oh bias gosh. in grading. And no student is forced to take his class. Rasmussen does not believe students should be concerned about bias. Not at all. Um, I think, think less than in mind than in most. I try to bend over backwards if students disagree with me politically.
He bends over backwards for students that disagree with him politically. You yeah. said that. It's, well, <sighs> what, what's the funniest thing about all this is so the article that he cites, it can mm-hmm. I I'm going to say I don't agree with their conclusions don't. about what's causing it, of course, yeah. but they do mention how an academia discourse is is becoming more difficult for for these reasons. So exactly what they state, you know, he makes a statement about men geniuses, and instead of being of being able to objectively talk about how to measure IQ or anything, people just go oh, racist, sexist, blah. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what this article says, though. Is now we can't even have <laughs> any sort of controversial debate because people just go so, out. So oh. what happened? What this article warns about happened. Basically, oh, and that's good. what's so ironic mm. is that these these people, and especially that woman who's kind of coming out as attacking him, she she fits that article stereotype, yeah. and that's also unfortunate. Mm-hmm. Instead of you know just saying, well, you know, maybe uh, there there are other reasons behind this article. Let's talk. Let's yeah. let, you know. Let's let's engage in discourse. Because that's what college is about. It's, it's, no, it's not. It's about complaining and, oh, we're going to protect you students. You don't have to take his class. Don't worry. Oh, the big, evil boogeyman. Yeah. But you should be met with adversity in college. Yes, that used to be the point the of college. Point. Yes. And yeah, you may encounter people with views contrary to yourself, but that's... He's also Christian and yeah. very outspoken Christian, so people don't like that either. But... You know, if we got to respect each other's beliefs. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I I expect a Christian to treat, you know, everyone fairly, whether they're gay, transgender, whatever. But I also expect everyone to, you know, atheists to respect Christians and let them do their thing. Let everybody do their thing. Yep. And the report (laughs) that we just pulled from, actually, this is at the very end of the video, and I usually cut, I usually don't even play this part of videos usually, because it's usually, hey, subscribe to our YouTube, good morning, so I, but this is at the very end of this video. I did not edit this, so it's actually cut off, so let's take a look. Very pertinent piece of information for the report, I feel. As for this tweet, he says he supports women in academia. That's all. (laughs) As for this tweet, it says he supports women in academia. Not even academia. I can't even complete the word. What? At the very end of the report, that's all you get. Yeah. As for this tweet, he says he supports women in academia. And his wife works in academia, too. Could have said that. They left that part out. So, obviously, he can't be (laughs) that sexist. I'm sure (laughs) sure she was going to say his wife works in academia. It's just, it's, why? It's just so weird. That's that's obvious. That was an obvious slant right there in the art and the reporting. Frustrating the... A slant. A little let's, frustrating. Let's have some discourse. Let's talk. Let's find our middle ground let's, again. Let's let's all college. be hippies. Let's all love the yeah. planet. Let's all be like Elon Musk. <laughs> CBS News. Tesla receives nearly two hundred thousand pre-orders for Cybertruck. Tesla CEO Elon Musk says the company has more than one hundred eighty thousand pre-orders for its first electric pickup truck. Musk unveiled the Tesla Cybertruck last week to mixed reviews. Potential buyers have to shell out $100 to place an order. Tesla says the fee is fully refundable. You know that that's this Cybertruck right there. Oh, in the back. I yeah. had no idea. It's a Cybertruck. That's a logo. I was listening to some logo artists talk about the logo design for this truck and all deep dissected. Yeah, that's a Cybertruck in the back. Huh. Yeah. I mean, that, that doesn't catch my eye. My yeah, eye. I know it looks like a bunch of... <laughs> yeah, if you hadn't pointed that out to me, I would not. And it looks like a bunch of lights or something. <laughs> the truck's debut did not exactly Ooh. go as planned. Musk tried to demonstrate the supposedly indestructible windows, but they shattered. Musk's <laughs> net worth dropped $768 million following the incident. Oh, oh, shattered twice. Dang. According to Musk, bad. it was because the window, they hit the door first? It didn't look it's like it's supposed hit the to be door. bulletproof, though. No, they hit. They were hitting the door first. They were bam. Oh, the really? Something during the demo, yeah. I I still don't get how hitting the door would suddenly. I don't not get how it. you have a because it's it's a prototype, so it's not a real vehicle. Yeah. How are those windows not you know three inch pieces of polycarbon or something? It's yeah. not actually breakable, so it doesn't break. That's true for your demo. But you, yeah, but <laughs> your your company, you have a company building rockets and stuff for us and. Yeah. Like, wow, that's weird. Satellite. Oh, RT, astronomers protesting SpaceX Starlink sats, as in 
Garden of Eden as it gets. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. She explained it, but I don't even know. Starlink is a planned system of satellites orbiting the Earth in different positions that all work together with the goal of delivering high-speed internet to the entire world. So far, SpaceX has launched 122 of them successfully. 122 Wait. satellites. <laughs> and just how many by are space. they going to put up? SpaceX. With a plan to have a whopping 12,000 of them Whoa. up there by the mid-2020. 12,000 satellites. Right now, we have a, a little over 1,800. So they want 12,000? Uh, that's, a, that's a lot of satellites up in space. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's damn. And you can't even make a bulletproof window? <laughs> now, this is a plan that would provide high-speed internet to places where there is none. It could help bring people out of poverty and save lives. It could also help people around the world access incredibly important news articles from incredibly important sites like BuzzFeed, too, right? Uh, so giving the internet to poor people in places like Africa sure sounds like something hipsters would want to get behind. But nope, they aren't. Instead, they're all pissing on the Starlink project because they say all those shiny satellites in space are cluttering up the night sky, making it harder to see constellations. Which of they stars. are. Yeah. In fact, the International Astronomical Union issued a statement saying, satellite constellations can pose a significant or debilitating threat to important existing and future astronomical infrastructures. Yes. According to BuzzFeed's piece entitled, Elon Musk's Wi-Fi satellites are blocking astronomers' view of the sky. Others have expressed their anger too. In fact, most of the news I have read about the Starlink project focuses on this issue, the fact that the satellites could mess up our view of the night sky, instead of focusing on the progress that the system promises for the entire globe. And 100% of the news I've read about it, whether positive or negative, has been thanks to Wi-Fi, a privilege that this system is striving to bring to everyone else who might not have it yet. Yeah, I think she likes Starlink. I can't yeah. tell. She's very sarcastic, so it's really hard to read sarcasm I, from the Russians. You know, it's really hard. Scientists are extremely upset. Very about upset that about this. They're and talking about what she ta Wi-Fi. You mean Wi-Fi? Where I've seen articles where Wi-Fi is killing plants. I have I'm not. Not really. In, I'm not into blanketing the planet with Wi-Fi. Yeah. Plus, it, well, like you mentioned, so we're going to go from almost two thousand to six times as many, or. I yeah. thought it was 22,000, but either way, that's outrageous. Yeah. And Several thousand more than <laughs> currently yeah. in space. But what people don't realize is this satellite tracks across the sky, and then it leaves this little trail, but then that covers up the distant stars that you know astronomers are trying to observe. So if, if they're, <laughs> they're trying to observe these very, very distant, very faint light sources, and just like you get light pollution in the city, mm -hmm. and you can't see the stars in the city... It's going to essentially be the yeah. same thing for these astronomers. and but The satellites. Yeah. So many satellites. There's going to be so much pollution up there if, if they get their way. But, but no, well, well, they're already causing pollution. Well, yeah. The ones they put. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's just going to get worse. Of course. But yeah. Now so we're protesting. Now people are going to say, whoa, 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 slow down there. Maybe. Yeah. I don't Maybe. Know. That's, that's always an issue with progress. What about 5G? Yeah. BBC Click, will 5G affect weather forecasts? Scientists have figured out that 5G equipment uh, that telecommunications companies want to deploy, particularly in cities, uh, may actually interfere with signals that are bouncing out of satellites in space into Earth's atmosphere and back to sense uh, a very important component uh, for making weather forecasts. So let's try and explain the problem. And bear in mind, I am a scientist, not an artist, so bear with me, okay? So what weather satellites are looking for when they monitor the atmosphere is microwave transmissions. And they're coming from things like clouds, from snow, from rain, from water vapor as well. Very faint microwave signals at very precise frequencies. So for example, here's a little water vapor molecule. It's vibrating away at 23.8 gigahertz. Right next to that frequency is 24 gigahertz, which is one of the ones that's been auctioned off for use in 5G. Now you can't just ask that little mm. molecule to tune out of the way. And that's the fundamental problem. That's why weather scientists are really worried. Looks like they're about to get some rather noisy neighbors. If they're Ooh. Yeah. noisy neighbors, I got Those... more. <laughs> just want to pause it just in case you want to give some commentary.
I'm just saying it's getting crowded uh -huh. on those radio waves. Keep yeah. going. Some rather noisy neighbors. <laughs> if they're broadcasting loudly in the house next door, or in our case, in the frequency band next door, even if what they're leaking is quite a small amount of their power, it can still be much larger than what we're trying to measure. We're going to be in a very difficult world where you know, we're not necessarily sure what we're measuring anymore. That's kind of bad. Yeah. Kind of bad. Are we measuring interference? Are we measuring the signal? That's, uh, that's yeah. the worst fear. Uh. The complex weather models used in today's forecasts need satellite data on a global scale. A storm now hitting Europe might have started life days earlier in North America. The World Meteorological Organization in Geneva, Switzerland, organizes that exchange of data, and they're worried a reduction in quality could have real-life consequences. Consequences that could have been avoided. Look at this building they're in. They yeah, really care about global warming and climate change. Uh, this building's uh, humongous. Giant glass building in Geneva. Yeah. Oh, oh my fancy. gosh. Yeah, okay. <sighs> If we don't have this specific measurement, in fact, we will lose three to six hours to inform population of the risk of a special events, meteorological special events, like floods, flash floods, or storms, or things like that. So the scientists worrisome. are really worried. Mm -hmm. The US regulators don't seem to think there's that much of an issue. While one representative of the telecoms companies has actually called the scientists' fears absurd yeah there's apparently a large pushback by the telco saying don't listen to the scientists they don't know what they're talking Dang. about they're crazy yeah can't, can't we just slow down <laughs> though and and test it and you know see no, who's fine. correct need ask 5G. the data you gotta save gotta save people 5g get some data 5g, 5G. <laughs> no I, what's wrong with 4g is anyone having problems with 4g i really don't what yeah. what are people watch what are people doing on their phones that they need this Plus. faster connectivity Plus, you need a a little five G booster every what one hundred yards meters or meters so? or something. Yeah, meters. Meters. So that's basically every block. This is no. that's a lot of infrastructure. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Not, not even talking about health concerns. That's a, a lot of boxes. How much does each box, box cost? How are you gonna put it in rural rural, rural Washington? Rural anywhere. Rural, rural America. 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 You know, all that we've learned recently is there's a a lot of empty space. There's a lot of rural America. <laughs> yeah, we also s can see the stars now. Just yes. FYI. <laughs> In rural America, you can see the stars. It's fascinating. <laughs> PBS NewsHour. How Minneapolis became the first to end single-family zoning. The city's population's been rising faster than at any point in the last 70 years, increasing by more than 12% to almost 430,000 between 2010 and 2018. But the number of new housing units hasn't kept pace. One report showed that among similarly sized cities, the Minneapolis metro area has the third largest housing production shortfall. As a result, Edward... San Francisco's number one. It's just, you know, of course, always San Francisco with the housing problems. Yeah. Fall. Atlanta, result, though. Yeah, that's shocking. Yeah, that is shocking. That's not even on the radar. Edward says he's seen rents and home prices spike. Some people don't move because they know, you know, finding a new apartment, they'll be paying an extra hundred dollars or whatever in rent and they can't afford it. Jacob Fry is the mayor of Minneapolis. The reality is, is that when you have demand that is sky high and you don't have the supply to accommodate, the prices continuously get jacked up. Are you seeing affordable housing options disappear from this area? Absolutely. Whether it be rental or from a home ownership. Home ownership. Um, yeah, they're all going away. Yeah. They talk about cash offers and everything in this report, but I took that all out. <laughs> those are pop. Those are there too. Everywhere, all the everyone's having this issue, where these houses, when they do pop up, they get bought up really quick. Yeah. So lower income families came and qualify because lower income families require on the loan process and crap too. Is, we would require. Every, yeah. A lot of people would require. Yeah. A lot, people, a lot of cash would require that so people are getting priced out really fast so it's just exacerbating the income gap is what you're telling me maybe and they're dwindling fast in a city with virtually no rent control the housing shortage has meant that low-income long-time residents are being priced out of the neighborhood says montgomery your um, housing options have become significantly impaired is what i would say so even home ownership is becoming challenging when people are facing cash bids oh, my bad. cash <laughs> offers and so homes are being sold same day so i think that we're certainly filling the squeeze last year to address this lack of supply city leaders came up with a 
bunch of ideas. One in particular raised eyebrows because it would completely eliminate single family zoning. Single family zoning. Dang. Dang. Brief history of zoning laws. Cities began enacting single-family zoning in the early 1900s, leading to the creation of that classic American neighborhood, block after quiet block of single-family homes. But Getz says the practice had an underside. In some cases, it ended up helping perpetuate segregation. Single-family homes... He's a professor. We'll get back to him later. He's a professor of something, something big and prestigious tend to cost more, making these neighborhoods available only to those with money, who were often mostly white. And you saw the emergence of a lot of different techniques for creating zoning requirements that effectively kept out low-cost housing and by extension then uh, kept um, racial barriers uh, in place as well. In Minneapolis, which is about 60 percent white, Almost three-quarters of the city's residential property was zoned for single-family homes. Other neighborhoods with more affordable, multi-family housing, like areas around Powderhorn Park, came to have more people of color. Single-family zoning has had other consequences, too, and not just in Minneapolis. With fewer people allowed to live on each lot, cities sprawl as their population grows. And that usually means residents need cars to get around, leading to congestion and increased emissions. Wow. Yeah. Crazy stuff. Zoning laws in Minneapolis. Would you like to learn about the leaders proposed? Yeah. What they so proposed? So leaders in Minneapolis proposed the idea of eliminating single-family zoning altogether to increase density, create more housing units, and help address racial segregation. In 2018, the proposed ban was included in a massive city planning document released every 10 years that requires a city council vote. The plan included 100 policy proposals on everything from Whoa. housing to transportation yeah. to the environment. One of those big plans. Yeah. Sure, that plan cost a lot of money to put together. It usually gets little public attention, but thanks in large part to the zoning ban, this time was different. People are getting priced out of the city. I oppose the plan. We do need more housing. Our population is growing incredibly. I feel strongly that much more study and public in One of the, see, you see that sign neighbors for more neighbors? Yeah. They're the pro group on this side. I couldn't really find a good argument for them, but just put our needed. I support the 2040 plan. We just need more housing diversity in general. But opposition was strong too. This community is angry. This community is divided. You shouldn't be tearing down our neighborhood. Many of the opponents who attended city meetings were from neighborhoods zoned mostly for single-family homes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Duh. They're the ones with the vested interest. People living in an apartment aren't going to care about zoning laws. They have no interest in that. They don't yeah. own the land. They don't own, they have no interest in what the zone is. Ay, ay, ay. All right. Want to hear from Minneapolis for everyone? They're the group that was against it. The other group, I couldn't really find a good argument. They just said, oh, it was the guy you heard in the beginning. He said, oh, everyone should be able to walk to work and be environmentally friendly and be able to grocery and that, that was his whole argument it was not very yeah not very well thought out so minneapolis for everyone let's see what they have lisa mcdonald is a former member of the city council who also once ran the city zoning committee she <laughs> co-founded the group minneapolis for everyone which opposed the plan and the problem is you want to put density where you get the biggest bang for your buck so that's on transit lines commercial corridors where things are already built up in order to uh, take advantage of the infrastructure improvements you've already made and what's available. If you just throw three plexes out any place in any place, you don't get um, the kind of density that really works. McDonald worries. But you do get density. Yeah. Single family homes will be torn down and design guidelines won't go far enough to protect a neighborhood's character. Particularly in terms of working with developers to say, this is what you can build, this is what you have to do, and you have to meet these. And McDonald points out that even if adding new triplexes around town does increase supply, it doesn't mean they'll be affordable. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I think we could end up with all this density, all this market rate housing, and really no more affordability. There you go. More yeah. people live in there, and you're just, exactly, that is the, exactly the problem right there. Those were my thoughts as yeah, with the suburb. You're going to have 
one landlord. Yeah, controlling everything. Yeah, controlling three properties now on yeah. one single family or what That's used great. to be. So a now the poor family. people we were trying to help, we're, they're going to be more poor because now they can't even buy their own land. So now yeah. they run the risk of being evicted all the time. Yeah, that sounds great. Let's help people. Let's help yeah. people not be, mm. not have any kind of independence or any kind of freedom. Yeah, why don't we help people, you know, buy, buy homes, homes, get out of apartments? Mm-hmm. Or- no. Mayor Jacob Fry, let's hear what he has to say. Changing the zoning is not going to solve the whole thing, but it is one really important facet. You got to first change the zoning to quite simply allow for affordable housing in some of these neighborhoods. Will this actually lead to more affordable housing, though? I mean, the market is so tight here. Um, there is a concern <sighs> that the... Uh, the market's tight everywhere. Yeah, but, well... It's, but that's the issue is yeah. no one no one can buy. So let's change the zoning laws and make... Yeah. Every one single house into four. Yeah. Let's split up in four ways. Let's not address the issue that housing is probably overinflated anyways. Units that are going to get built are still going to get built in the most desirable parts of the city, and they're going to be market rate units, and they're still going to be unaffordable for a lot of people. The single family zoning issue is an important piece, but it's just one part of an overarching plan to attack the affordable housing crisis that we're dealing with here in Minneapolis and that many cities are seeing throughout the entire country. Fry's- Good job. He spoken like a true politician. Yeah, because again, we're not building houses yes. and no one has anything to buy. Says the city's doing a lot more than just changing zoning. This year's budget included $40 million for affordable housing, three times the city's previous largest Ooh. investment. Yeah. And the mayor's proposing another $31 million for next year. I'm wondering if are those houses that are going to be sold off to families or are those apartment complexes yeah. that are going to be owned and then... Hmm. Given the general trend that we've seen, I would assume that you're correct in speculating that they're going to be apartments. So then you don't have a path to home ownership. That's great. Yeah. yeah. The city's also planning to implement something called inclusionary zoning, requiring developers to include affordable units in large new apartment buildings. And the mayor has plans to tackle homelessness and strengthen tenants' rights. As for the single-family zoning change, it was officially adopted by the Minneapolis City Council earlier this month and will go into effect on January 1st. Not moving to Minneapolis. Not that I would move there anyways. But. Can't afford land anyways. Yeah. It doesn't matter. HealthyTalkShow.com slash support. If you want to help us buy some land, hang out. We can do a Healthy Talk Show studio. It'll be real great. Yeah. Before we round out and discuss this, just really quick, an interesting take on single family homes from the professor in this report. Edward Getz is a professor and director of the Center for Urban and Regional Affairs at the University of Minnesota. I think there's just a growing understanding that perhaps the era of the single family home district is something that we can no longer afford in terms of the use of land. And I think that um, really? there has been That's what he a says? shift in urban planning thinking towards more densification and for more intensification of land use. More intensification mm-hmm. Wait, of what? land use. Didn't he more de- what did he have? Sorry, more, play that again? Yeah. <laughs> In urban planning thinking towards more densification and for more intensification of land Yeah, use. more intensification and densification. More intensification and intensification. Intensification and densification. I don't know what it is. He's a professor. He's a, pro- he's, he's a professor. <laughs> so am I. Professor. Can I just draw a buzzer? Professor, but he's a professor. He gets as yeah. a professor and director of the Center for Urban and Regional Affairs at the University of Minnesota. That's just yeah. an interesting take. We can no longer afford, we can't, Really? But <laughs> really? What what if That's going like, to be a problem because yeah. United our country is kind of based on the idea of land ownership. Yeah. That's a huge issue if we try to take that away. There's still a lot of land out there. Yes. That's what Don't believe kind of what this guy is telling you. Yeah. <laughs> or what about looking, Leave the cities. looking towards more sustainable living, like growing your own food in your backyard? Mm-hmm. That would lower your carbon footprint. You don't have to import food from yeah. everywhere. Yeah. You know, oh, shopping locally. Well, having land, garden. you can do a lot of things. But Precisely. if you live in an apartment, you can't. Yeah. You can't even have pets most yeah. of the time. You can't even have pets. You can't smoke in your own apartment. Forget that. Yeah. Are you? Ah, no. Yeah, you gotta this have is, freedom no, to do what you want again, in your house. People, and, people like apartments. That's cool. Like yeah. the 
former city council, whatever her name was, what she said, that's fine. You know, dense urban areas. Yeah, pu- where yeah. the public transit is. That's where high density housing needs to be. That's effective. Yeah. Have it around the train station, right? You know, have it. But if you put it out in a rural area, it's really stupid. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. really make too much sense. That's, that's very true. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Very frustrating. Uh, are you good? Be yeah. good. All right. If you want to help us produce this show financially, healthytalkshow.com slash support value for value. Is that right, Marissa? Yeah. So head on over <laughs> healthytalkshow.com slash support. It helps us remain unbiased and lets us talk yeah. about a lot of content. And how much is Starbucks, about? really? How much is a Starbucks? How much does coffee cost at Starbucks? Everybody goes Four, there five every bucks. day. Five bucks. You can send us five yeah. bucks a month. You'll have... skip, skip one day of skip Starbucks. Skip one day of Starbucks and I will teach you how to make my delicious cold brew. Yeah. Robert does make really good coffee. So head on over to healthytalkshow.com slash support. And we record Healthy Talk Show live Mondays and Thursdays at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's 3 a.m. UTC over at healthytalkshow.com forward slash live. Another way to provide value is feedback. Email ask at healthytalkshow.com. Call us 509-878-3229. And healthytalkshow.com forward slash social for all of our social media links. Love and light. Love and light.